There was a whole year where I thought like I shouldn't do this anymore, which is crazy for a 25 and 26 year old to be asking themselves that, you know? And so that literally, that's why I was like, I'm not gonna teach character stuff forever. I was like, I just want, <laughs> I want anyone to take a class and realize like they don't have to maybe feel like one school is their identity. Cause I, I, I think it was a real mind fuck. And I think it, you know, was also like, you guys gotta update your system. I think this year really opened up a lot of schools' eyes to that and they're really trying to like change the infrastructure of it, but I hope that isn't just like a blanket statement to get press off their case and that they really follow through with that because otherwise it just isn't indicative of comedy right now. This is Startup and Storefront, the podcast where we inspire entrepreneurship through truth. Today's guest is Hannah Pilkus, the comedian, actress, and writer. Hannah got her start in the Kevin Bacon drama, The Woodsman. If you're familiar with that movie, you'll know it's about as far from comedy as a movie can get. But acting in the movie was enough to reinforce Hannah's love for performing, and though it took a while, she did eventually find her own voice and a following on Vine. Thankfully, Hannah's career has lasted much longer than the platform that launched her. She continues to reach a wide audience today through her stand-up performances, comedy skits on social media, and is even writing and developing a TV show. So listen in as we cover everything from why she doesn't consider what she writes to be jokes, how she's managed to continuously promote her activism alongside her comedy, and why she thinks 80% of stand-up in the Midwest should probably cease to exist. Now, back to the episode. All right, welcome to the podcast on today's show, Hannah Pilkus. Thanks for joining. Thanks for having me. Please introduce yourself as the world knows you. Hi, I'm... um comedian, actress, writer. I hate the slashes, but it's what I am. Hannah Pilkis, and I'm super excited to be here. So Natalia has this thing where she cackles every once in a while, and I know that's like true comedy, at least for her. Like she has this like deep cackle. He loves it, but it's horrible. And it makes me laugh. Like, Ooh, a weird one laughs a better is a better laugh in it's my, by my metric. It's weird. <laughs> is it? Yeah, so when she's heard watching, it yet. Yeah, <laughs> you'll hear it. Yeah. I hope I get to. When she's watching your Instagram in particular, she's cackling. Yes, and I'm like, it's an ugly laugh. It really is. Yeah, I love picturing you like at a bar or something, <laughs> yeah. just like with this awful cackle. It's and you're bad. like, sorry, it's a minute long video. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <How did> just <laughs> pay attention to something else, please. What made you want to get into comedy? Like, how soon did you want to go down that path? Were you a kid? Were you when always into it? I was a kid. It? I did a lot of dramatic acting. I was in a movie called The Woodsman. With that was the first thing I ever did with Kevin Bacon, where he plays a pedophile. Yeah, I think I've like, seen that. Really heavy. What role did you play in that? Uh, like a victim of abuse. So okay. naturally, not my comedy. Segue to comedy wow. was a seamless <laughs> one. Um, no, We're but I was like, dark. definitely per- a nonlinear progression there. Totally. Well, I think I realized how much I love like performing, but I realized over the years doing like Second City and groundlings in these different schools, how much I love having my hands in other elements of the creative process. And I feel like comedy just came a little pretty naturally to me in that like regard. So I still love both, but I just, I love comedy so much. So it kind of felt like the world was pulling me in that direction with online stuff. And so I was like, okay, this is, this is what I'm going to do. And was it like stand up that you would try your comedy? Like what, did you just try it at home? What was like, you the know, thing? it's, I've done all, all the things, but I would say online was always like the most traction on, you know, Vine and Instagram and now TikTok, I guess. And all my shows, I would host like variety type shows. So they would have stand-ups, but then I would be able to do, you know, I'd have a stand-up and then I would do like every mother in a horror movie and the lights would change and I would do this whole weird character thing where I'd be like, Billy, or, you know, yeah. whatever. So, Your impressions. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I just, I would just love, I like. Wait, like what? Like weird observational comedy or I'll do like, and now a Dutch chef is going to come teach you a recipe and I would come on as a Dutch chef. I mean, like it definitely didn't That's make hilarious. me the cool girl in comedy, sure. but I was like, I got to be authentic to me. And this was all in LA, here in LA or were you LA, somewhere else? I mean, all over. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I brought a show to Edinburgh a couple of years ago or right before the pandemic, the summer before the pandemic, that was like a character driven comedy show about Disney princesses that was really raunchy and, and edgy. And it was like an adult comedy about like the cackles coming we out. We played She's like, like the, right there. you know, the ketamined up parents we played the kids we played the princesses we played the woke balloon artists like it was this really immersive (laughs) fun weird show and I kind of like that immersive element I think that's why I like the internet is it feels like like recently I did a who is she series where I just asked people to tell me 
what this person was in a wig. And then I did my 10 favorites. I got like hundreds of responses and it was so fun because it was like this interactive kind of way of doing comedy. Yeah. That's so fascinating. So you started out on Vine or like that was like where you like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I was, I'm curious, like I know that there's some basics that every comedian must have, but I know that for each platform, there's also, it's a very specific route that you have to take to, in order to kind of sell yourself on that. Like it's different from Vine to YouTube to stand up. One example example of this is I saw King Bach. King uh, Batch, yeah. Batch, yeah. And I, I saw it him should at be. A, it says It's spelled like Bach, so I don't know why uh, yeah. we should know it's Batch without the T, but, okay. you know, so it's batch. in your defense. <laughs> yeah. It's so, B-A-C-H, so you're like, Bach. Right. Yeah. Like that, that's how <laughs> I would pronounce it. Named after the composer. Right. Uh, I saw him at a Groundlings special, mm -hmm. and you know, I know he's massive online yeah. and he has a lot of followers and he's he's funny because he knows that platform. Mm -hmm. But when he was at Groundlings doing stand-up live in person, he was easily the worst one on the stage. And it was clear that he was taking Groundlings to Shots improve fired, at it. bro. This was a couple Ooh. years ago, so I think he's gotten better. Hot or, take. But, <laughs> yeah. I mean, King Batch is brilliant. But I also think that, it, to your point, I mean, I had to kind of learn that. And do, I would be... When I was crushing it the most on Vine, that's when my live performing took the biggest hit. And I had to sort of learn that they're completely different skill sets. So, and same thing with like an Edinburgh show where you're, it's heavily dependent on the audience and you have to take the temperature of the room and what you had written might have to change on the spot if it's like an older audience or a younger audience. Improv and, element. Yeah, whereas, and also when you're on the internet, you get to self-edit. So, I mean, there's like beauty to both, but it's like, there is nothing like, like I remember one of the shows we did at Edinburgh, it was like, it was a late night show, so, and everyone was wasted. And one girl, Scottish girl, cause we're in Scotland, she's like, you're not funny, you're gross. <laughs> and I was like, and I remember like my girl, I like brushed a tear. And then I was like, but you know what? There is a beauty to this happening is like, I'm feeling like a visceral response. Whereas you can't really feel internet trolls, you know? It's like, yeah. But it is such a different, I think you have to really know how to turn it on in each way. And there's no one way to do it, I don't think. <laughs> you have to have thick skin too, it seems. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I mean, that girl was wasted and apparently got kicked out of a bunch of shows because she was just like a heckler for yeah. sport. It builds character. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> but it is easier to just do the internet stuff sometimes when you're like, I'm going through a sensitive patch. I can just filter through the comments I don't like, you yeah. know? How totally. do you make it in comedy? Like what is, so the traditional path I would imagine is, you know, you start doing these comedy sellers or stuff like that. And then maybe you're getting like the primetime spots and then yeah. ideally like somebody sees you and puts you in a TV show. But today there's some, like to your point, there's Vine, there's Instagram. I don't know that there's one way anymore. I right. mean, like I'm developing a show now that I wrote, you know, and that's been much more my and how, how did that kick off? So I was lucky that people were fans of Instagram and then, you know, and then I had written a sample and I developed a show to be able to, one thing I've learned is you can't rest on any one thing. Like, it's not like, you know, people said for a lot of years, I go to meetings and they'd be like, your videos are great. And I'd be like, yeah. And they were like, and what? And I didn't have any what. So you have to have the what ready to go in every, I think you just really <laughs> have to have cylinders out everywhere, like coals in every fire kind okay. of thing. <laughs> just never stop. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I'm lucky that I have a really patient partner who knows that I'm kind of going to always be, the wheels are always turning, but I found someone that's really good at helping me take like week long breaks sometimes. Cause I think those are also important to refuel and. Do you spend a lot of time like creating? So when you think about creating a video for Instagram, do you spend a lot of time either writing that out or does that come more natural compared to like what's on stage? I don't really like to write things okay. out. I like to discover it by whether like whether I put the wig on and then spend an hour just improvising as that person <laughs> maybe to my detriment sometimes I don't like to write things out but like it's so different when you're writing a script or something but comedy wise I think I find things more organically when I'm not in my like super cerebral brain so I'll put the wig on and just film and then I'll look at the 20 minutes and be like what are the two minutes of gold that I like within this. Okay. Um, I, yeah, I think I like being really immersed in something more than I like a computer screen. That's like podcasting, I think. is low, It's more freeform. And like yeah. sometimes if you try to outline it, you, you basically make the room a lot smaller. Like you make it compressed and nothing can flower or develop. And then it's just like bad, really. Totally. No, yeah. I think it's really, really hard to like boil down something to like, you know, and that's a very specific purpose for something. You know, when I'm pitching something, I have to make it more surgical and specific, but 
the joy of comedy and podcasting and as like the discoveries you make along the way, I think. Yeah. And otherwise I think it's just not that fun for me. And if it's not fun, then I'm like, then why would I do this career path? You know? Totally. <laughs> do you have like a dream sequence of events? Yeah. Like that I solve at my show and that I get to ha- wear those hats, like creator and one of the stars of it and probably writing as well. Um, so what's your ideal incredible. network that you'd sell it to? It'd be streaming for sure. Like okay. Hulu or Netflix, HBO Max. Um, so you obviously wrote that in mind as opposed to like, you know, seven minute act breaks in between for broadcast. Yeah, I definitely didn't write it to be a multicam or like a, I mean, it's definitely more not adult as in, you know, after hours adult, but I think it caters and gears more to a streaming audience and that I, I'd love to have more permission to kind of go to those places a little bit and I think like HBO Max I think is taking really amazing risks comedically and also genre bending and telling you know even not comedic like I may destroy you and I just think they're taking really cool risks and telling stories in a really nuanced way like I may destroy you is all about assault in a really artistic and poetic and I think it's starting conversations and ideally even the comedy I'm watching like I, I like the show Hacks. I, I think love it starts a show. conversation and and like my favorite comedy right now, the one I'm creating, or multiple shows I'm creating, have these older veteran comedians with the up and coming ones because I think it's a really cool hybrid. And I think we love like I want to watch these comedy queens. You know, it seems like young comedians want to see like what's in the head, the mind of you know that legend, yeah. and then the legends want to see. Well, these kids, I mean, are so different than me and they're coming up with all this technology, you know, what's going through their minds and wanting to bridge that gap. And without boiling that down to some trope where it's like kids and their gadgets, you know, it's like there's something to be learned from each side. And I feel like there's something that's kind of cool that's happening right now where it's like we're listening to Gen Z more. And also like some boomers have a point, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, certainly not politically in a lot of ways, but like, you know, in a lot of I just think it's like a cool melding of the world. So What's the culture like in terms of Gen Z millennials versus boomers in terms of just comedians? Is there generally a support system where the, the older cra- the old guard tends to help those coming up next? I mean, yes. Like, I think it's kind of all who, who your circles are. Uh, one of the reasons that, and this isn't any sort of slight on stand-up, I admire stand-up's ability to really like stand on their own two feet oftentimes without the support of others. And yet mics and shows offer that sort of camaraderie, but I have always loved collaboration for that reason. And like writing these ensemble sort of projects because I like the idea of like working in tandem with these like more powerful, like comedians that are maybe more well-versed in it. Again, I think it's like surrounding yourself with people that aren't coming from a competitive place and rather are like there's room for everybody. And you can have a totally different experience out here. And I feel like the first few years of my time out here were with probably me in the wrong places, thinking like there can only be one funny woman, which is like now I'm so of the opposite camp where I'm like, if I can't do this, I'm going to recommend these five people for this. And, you know, it's just better that way. And I think energetically it's better that way. And also Again, we've so many platforms. There is room for everybody. There we, really is. We're all know? from the East Coast too, and I know you mm-hmm. are too. We're from New York, yeah. And I think we all share this, where we all came out to LA and and felt that that there was room for everyone, and that you know your competitors back east were here, your collaborators, and that LA yes. is just such a spot for that. It's just been so amazing. And it's cool because then you can you can kind of bring that mentality back east with you, and you. I also just think the times are changing a bit, right? It's competitive as ever, and yet. I feel like if I have a win, so many people that I know will share it and prop me up and, and we all do the same for each other. And it's, it's like this trust and this like confidence is really sexy right now, which is nice. Like, I feel like there was an age of self-deprecation being like the thing. I remember a lot of my comedy being like, I'm tall. And now I'm like, I'm fucking tall. Like, it's so funny how the very same thing can be now a strength to me, but it's like, we're celebrating that confidence in a way that I don't think we were before. And it's nice. It's like, no, it's people don't, it's not arrogance. It's like, let people celebrate who they are. You know, it's more fun to play that way. Anyway. It also seems like there's more chance for collaboration. So like with this show yeah. that you're developing, I'm sure that you, I don't know, I'm going to assume that you maybe wrote some of the parts with people that you know in mind for them. And it goes back to 
every like generation has had their groups. Like you yeah. think of the Freaks and Geeks group that has come up and yeah. done everything together and they're always in each other's movies. And they're, you know, you think of the Danny McBride group that has come up again and done everything together. Like if I feel like this culture, like you surround, like you said, you surround yourself with a great group yeah. and they celebrate your successes, you celebrate theirs. And it's always with the goal that like a rising tide lifts all ships. A thousand percent. And I think with comedy, it really is that. And it's like, it is a slow burn. Like it's so funny to liken it to um, wine or something, but I really feel like in comedy's case, people really do arrive at their voices a little bit later. Not not always, you know, you have your Hannah Einbenders who really knew at an early age, your Bo Burnham's, but ideally whoever has their first big win, it's like, well, I know this person to their core. I know their strengths and how to write for them, which also made the process of writing so fun because yeah, there's so many people that immediately come to mind. And what's cool about the internet is having formed these relationships with people I've really admired just because of Instagram um, that otherwise you would have to go, to go through reps and all these things. And now you kind of feel like, oh, there's more validity to me because we've kind of gotten to befriend each other in this weird sort of space, you know? But yeah, I mean, I think we're all of the camp that's like whoever pops off first, there's a spot for you there with me kind of thing. Would you ever do stand up or do you? I do. I'll do like storytelling stand up where I do character within stand up. I've never toured as a stand up. It's just never been my like primary goal. Sometimes I'm like, what do I have to say as Hannah? Like, I just, I think I have way more fun throwing on being a wig other and being characters. X, Y, other girl or anyone that not gender specific. But yeah, I mean, I love the art of stand up. If I was to do more of it, I think it would be like more Maria Bamford adjacent where it's kind of going in and out of these different personalities. And I just think she's so fearless and man, I don't know if I, yeah, it would take, I'd have to like really commit to just doing that. Cause you can't just jump into doing stand up. Totally, That's the yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. We had a friend of ours who, uh, Justin, who ended up like with a major comedian, like major. Whoa. But he doesn't Opening drink. Opening for him on tour. And these, this comedian drank a lot and like just party basically it was show party, show party, show party, show party. And because he didn't drink the comedian didn't like help him really. Like he wasn't making that come. He wasn't hanging out after hours or before the show. Like, and in so that then way. like he felt like his career became basically a, a function of if, am I going to drink or not? Which am is I gonna crazy, have a good but time? not at all surprising. Yeah. You know? And so he like, I, he became disillusioned with comedy in general. Cause he, he was really trying to go the stand up route. And so he was like, okay, if I'm not in this group anymore and they bad mouth me to this group, will another group take me on? What do they want? And it was like this very sad time for him where he had to rediscover himself and he started going to the internet because of that. Like all of a sudden he was posting way more and like creating his own content and getting creative in a different way. I mean, the, the stand-up world can be really dark. Depend Again, totally, like yeah. I said, depending on your he circles. Found and it. He found my introduction it. to it was like, kind of lecherous and creepy and like I was like I'm the only woman here there's a bunch of white guys straight white guys just talking about like fucking a girl and I'm like this isn't I'm not into it you know but what's cool is now especially in that like you have your Jerry Goldsteins your Nori Reeds you have Meg Stalter you have all these really cool comedians doing stand-up in a different way which I think makes me much more inclined to go do the shows because it's rewriting what that narrative looks like Kat Cohen oh I love Kat Cohen so much we were at Edinburgh at the same time Kat Co I mean yeah the list goes on and on Kate Berlant yeah Matt Rogers Bowen Yang like comedians that are doing it their way and making it okay to not have to do the kind of Midwest alcoholic straight <laughs> energy, which is like really A what deterred me initially and is kind of not being as rewarded as much. So yeah, it is a weird thing. I always just think about Joe Rogan because I'm like, I know him from podcasting and then I saw him on stage and I was like, oh, this guy's kind of funny. Yeah. But I don't know him in that way. I just know him in like the interviewing Elon Musk way. I've never seen him do stand up. Oh yeah. He puts a lot of time in. As a complete novice, so our, if I see a chef make a dish, I'm like, oh, that guy just took everything that I already had here and made something that I could never make. Yeah. And so are jokes the same way? Where it's like, you could just, it's like, oh, move this ingredient over here. It's right. So a comedian that I love, Nick Shepard, they started a mural company called Very Gay Paint. It's a couple. They're I two of my best friends, Jensen Titus and Nick Shepard. Um, they'd be great Paint. guests as well. Yeah. Very Gay Paint. And they make it. And they like <laughs> blown yeah. the fuck up. They were just an arch digest and it's crazy. But anyway, like Nick's That's favorite funny. thing to That's do sad. is like find the formula of the joke. Yeah. And his brain is like, he's like kind of like a beautiful mind when it comes to joke writing. And I just don't think I have that gene. Like, in fact, I don't even know if what I write are jokes or rather they're 
observations of human behavior and also just a lot of absurdity. You know, I, I, I would say my set, if I, you know, when I do stand up or when I perform is much more from like a storytelling lens, just leaning into like the funny things we do as people and exaggerating that. But I think like, yeah, it's jokes are so impressive. I think that was my initial thing was I was like, I don't think I know how to write jokes within stand up, but it is changing from that. It doesn't have to be that, but I want to yeah, try this. It's so hard. I have a story that I think is hilarious. Okay. We're, we're try oh, this, this is going to go well. It's, it might, I think we're going to just try this. Yeah. So. This is about Natalia and me being married to Natalia. Wait, which is what stand-up is, right? You just oh make boy. fun of the people around you. <laughs> we're, we're, you just put people yeah, on the spot. We're taking from you. personal that experience. That was the other thing was I was yeah. like, oh my God, there's nothing off lit. Like when you're up there and you're feeling, I'm like, right. I've divulged everything. Yeah, they and know I'm lucky everything. that Greg's cool with it, but like I've dated people where they were like, were you planning on airing everything? I'm like, he was getting a yeah. laugh. I'm sorry. No, just yeah. like, really working. I was yeah. on a roll. I gave it you're all funny. up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So okay, there's a nunnery. No, just kidding. It's nothing to do with that. So the joke goes like this. And so this is based in reality. And in my head, this is like hilarious how to tell this story. I'm not really sure about. So we'll see. In my family, being like Latino in general, mm -hmm. if you gained a little bit of weight oh boy. and you went to like a birthday party, some like your aunt would be like, gordito, like all like the first word. So you <laughs> harsh, got that right? harsh. You got that Oof, instant yeah. feedback. So loop. just body Ooh. image galore. So but like yeah. instant feedback. Yeah. But and like you, gordito, and that, and that, we love that, you. That, that you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's that was cushioned your, with yes. like your sweet. Yeah. Yeah. We yeah. love was, you no matter how fat you get. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah. so that was your cue to go uh, condescension. Uh, maybe yeah. uh, stop the cookies, basically. Yeah. But it, you knew. Yeah. And so it would happen around every family gathering. So I just grew up with the instant feedback loop. Yeah. And then my sister, We're on but then so here's, so, the thing. In, so here's the thing. So you get the little jab. Which can be great and also probably really great and terrifying. Like <laughs> my family family is not that honest. I th We're gonna get to that. So <laughs> so you get the little jab, and then your sister's somewhere at this party, right? And she goes, I told you he's fat. And so <laughs> your sibling would just cement it. Boom. Over. Right. Right. Right? Because in the meet, like you're at home, you got a sibling, you're like, am I getting a little chubby? Your sister might be like, absolutely, yeah. but you don't believe it. She's a hater. Right. Okay. Right. Siblings right. are blunt. So stick yeah. with me. So this is, this is how I was raised. Okay. In this environment of instant feedback loops, specifically around like birthdays, family events, dinners, which happen all the time in like yeah. a Latino community. We're not going to say who, gonna you're gonna do who you're talking about. We're going to do it. No, we're not. No, we're going to do it. No, we're not. Oh, we're not going to say it. Yeah. All right. So Natalia has someone in her family <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a lot of people really. And so they're a lot of I'm loving this it's putting huge, everyone on blast. Yeah, yeah. Huge Italian family. Okay. I mean, yeah. however we craft the joke yeah. is, at least in my head, doesn't matter. But to me, this is hilarious. So Natalia is FaceTiming with a family member. And I'm there next to her. I'm like, oh, hey. And all of me wants to say, you, you're looking a little chubby. <laughs> all of me is like, you plumped up. Right. You're having a good time. Right. I get it. Right. We've all been there. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking at Natalia like, you going to tell her? Uh -huh. I literally like she's FaceTime. Not how we operate. No, that's here. not and how she's we operate. Like, no, you don't tell. No. Wait, this is on FaceTime. FaceTime. Yeah. Wait, you're gonna call. You're gonna be like, by the way, great to see yes. you. You've rounded out. He's, so he's everyone in knows the corner. that iPhone camera adds so, twenty pounds. So he's my, in the corner going yeah. like this. So <laughs> my, <laughs> inverted lens. Yeah. My family does that. My family inst they are again so instant with feedback loop. Wow. If you're looking, much, if you're looking actually. fab, also like you're looking great. Oh, they're your hype team. They're your hype team. They're they're just there for you, really. And to keep it honest. And so I'm watching this, like, you're not going to, like, I'm in the background, like, what the fuck? Like, you got to say something. And she's like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we get off the phone. We, like, fight about this. I'm like, you don't, you don't just tell? No. Like, is it me? It seemed pretty obvious. To, I mean, like, she looks in the mirror. She knows. This isn't something. Right. We... So then it's like, do you have to reinforce? It, so <laughs> I'm, like, confused. So Natalia's like, we don't do this. And she gets all mad at me. And I'm like, I'm just saying, in my family, this is like grounds for improvement. This is not criticism. This is understanding. A wake-up call. So if a family member would say, like, oh, gordito or whatever, like you're would, looking like a would you tail. then be like, all right, time to, time yeah, to. Yeah, you would that be like, would, that's you how would you would feel know. like yeah. that was a, that was like your a little thank you show. for the gesture. Yeah. yeah. What a funny. It's so, it's so, so strange. Wait, it gets There's better. There's so many things I don't, <laughs> I don't know so if then, I understand yet. So this is like the tee up, right? So then it gets better. So then. I see, like, this is three days later, and by this time, like, this, this fight has subsided. Because I was legitimately confused. Like, you don't operate this way? Like, I was like, what? He's like and an so, anthropologist when it comes to... Yeah, then yeah, I become, so. like, an anthropologist. You have, like, like, the, like, thread, right. like, the yeah. map of... Yeah, wait a minute. How? <laughs> so then Natalia is in her closet, and she's, like, okay. putting a bunch of... No, it wasn't like that, though. Uh, hey, it wasn't my story, like that. my story, no. my story, listen. 
I, I so, was doing it at Marie Kondo moment. Okay. Of okay. Crazy. Irrelevant. You were clearing the space. Irrelevant. Yeah. And Natalia and the person that she was on the phone with were the same size at one time. Definitely not anymore. Okay. So Natalia's I, getting rid of so clothing. so minded Natalia's getting rid of clothing. And I'm like, oh, what do you do? She's like, oh, I want to ship clothes to person family member. So I go downstairs. I was purging my And I'm like, closet. that's some we gangster moved. fucking shit. <laughs> She won't tell you to your face, but she'll ship you a bag of clothes that you, that you will not fit in. But he interpreted that because of Just to get her point across. Nope. That I is I mean, it's gangster. a funny joke. It's not rooted in reality. It's incentive. That is no, gangster. It is not how- To that your is point, shot. I That's do, a grenade going on. It is on. like, I used to date someone from the UK, and like the way that we would have all said the same thing, but they're like roundabout repressed. Like we went yeah. to see fucking oh. Hamilton, and like- I'm bawling and I'm the only one cl- and everyone else is like so oh, like small claps, golf claps. They're There's just so no repressed. emoting and sharing and like sharing feelings. But d- did you mean it that way? I did not. I 100% did not. But you I was see cleaning what I'm out saying? my closet and I was just absentmindedly like yeah, there's half of this stuff I don't even need. I think if we were going to do a page yeah. one rewrite, we would make sure we'd gotten consent from all parties yeah. to tell <laughs> that story. Yeah, if we were going to mic exactly. that. Exactly. <laughs> and also, I understand how you, you say it's rooted in reality, but it's like, you know, some, a joke in the a making for sure. Move. That is like... Joke in the making. You, you know. might as well have sent COVID in a box. It was like, wow, <laughs> you're about box. to give this person a legit issue. I mean, that literally is a scene in Spanglish. Is it's it really? Tia Leone buys... Sarah Steele, her daughter. I don't know why I know this movie so well. She <laughs> buys her daughter all these clothes, and then her daughter's so happy, and then she's like, eight, 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 and she keeps looking, and the mom, and the mom's like, you'll fit into them, which is just the worst. That's the worst. Yeah, that's way to like tell someone thinking. something. It almost, yeah. I don't know which one's better. I also yeah. don't want someone to be like, fat. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know which, and that wasn't, I didn't mean you are. I just, <laughs> you know, I'm Nick's not trying. Nick's like, Nick's like, I'm training for a half marathon. I've been working so hard. I've been doing great. And no one notices. <laughs> no, I, I just, I don't know what's, what's the right approach. There's I laughed about this for days. There's a lot of jokes between our like, cultural differences. Funniest. Yeah, but that is such you know? a thing. It's yeah. so yeah. funny. It's that is such a, yeah, yeah. I mean, my dad's like super Dutch and right. like gossipy in there, you know. Did they move to uh, the States after having my you? My dad moved from Holland when he was like 18 or 19, but his oh, wow. accent would suggest otherwise <laughs> because he was like, very like, each. it sounds like he could have left like yesterday <laughs> from Holland, but I'm, I never want him to lose his amazing Dutch yeah. accent. I think perfect. at this point, he probably never will. He probably yeah. never will. Yeah. Yeah. And it is like such a part of his charm. And it's also like when you're getting married or when you're like families are joining, it's like the first time that you think about what different energies and like what different backgrounds like families coming together totally. will be like. And what what was it like when you moved out here? Like were they supportive or they are super supportive okay, amazing. of that. They were awesome. I mean, I couldn't have had more supportive parents. You know, so many people's parents are like, why are you doing this? You know, but I think that they really my mom wanted to be an actress in college and I think she was just really sensitive and would like not get one audition and would cry a lot and realize that this is probably a really unhealthy route not for her. her I would argue unhealthy for anybody but I honestly didn't feel like I had a choice like I was like well this is what I meant to do so well, how old were you when you were in the woodsman I was 11 or 12 wow and yeah so, and so after that I did a lot of drama yeah but then I took a break from acting to like go to high school and I didn't pick up again until I was like 18 or 19. I just was like, if I don't do this, it's probably going to be bad. <laughs> I'm probably going to drink a lot. And, <laughs> and I still did in my early 20s, yeah. but like from a healthy place. Right, right, right. Yeah. right. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't. Sophisticated. Yeah, yeah, yeah. totally. <laughs> uh, yeah. Right. Sophisticated binge drinking yeah. when you're 21. Some of the, the actors, because my brother is an actor, and so like he started Groundlings as a way to, not because he thinks of himself like as this like, comedy legend but because he knew it would help him with his acting just the the improv nature of it and I know a lot of people actually discover it through that and like whether they're a lot of it out here is through the Groundlings program or Second City LA or Upright Citizens Brigade Mm -hmm. but they discover that you know just the act of the learning like the yes ands and playing off of one another and and building it up and always trying to support the story and and lead towards something is something that they can bring towards any kind of acting whether it be drama or comedy and you know with your route I, I know we've kind of jumped back and forth but like I believe you went to the Groundlings, is that correct? Yeah, I did all, everything, pretty much. 
I would say that's probably the best way to utilize those schools. Like I loved my training at Groundlings. I was on the UCB Characters Welcome team. I guess I still am, but then the pandemic hit and we would do different characters monthly, which was great. Uh, And I did all of Second City Conservatory and would like perform in a running show there. I just never loved, like, I think it's better to approach it like, I want to become a stronger actor, or I want to gain, gain some skills. And the reason that, as a pastime, I started teaching character classes now was because I just felt like these institutions, like, crush people's confidence and identity oftentimes. I'm not trying to speak in, like, broad terms about it. I think that there's so many great things about it. I just think people don't make a company and they assume so much about themselves that they might just not have matched a specific mold. But I think like the training is invaluable. I think we're also kind of departing from that. You know, it seems like as a result of the pandemic, a lot of people are like, well, I'm a pioneer in my own right and I make content online and I started my own school or, you know, whatever. And I think, yeah, taking things from each is really great. I just, I never felt like any one made perfect sense for me. Is that why you did a little bit of of each one? Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I did a little bit of each one and started to make my own stuff a lot more was I just didn't want to feel like my only stage and performance opportunities were like the hierarchy of a school, you know? So I think it's like I've loved being on a team at one place or I've loved doing a a run of a show at one place. But the industry is so hard already and it can feel hard when there's hierarchy within a company. Because there um, is a very defined hierarchy within those. I know yes. just within Groundlings, there's like stage one. That's the entry level. Everyone goes through it. And then not everyone graduates to level two. Like they'll keep you in level one if they don't feel you're ready or whatever. But then let's say you make it to level two. Then there's still like a level three. And then there's like uh, three more levels after that where you eventually you might end up on the like the main stage squad. And then from there, that's where a lot of people jump off to Saturday Night Live or back in the day, Mad TV, or whatever it might be, but it's it's a pretty clearly defined path. It's like Scientology. Yeah. <laughs> and it's yeah. and I think like if it works your way, like that's great. But exactly. you know, in my case, no women made the company. No no women voted. It was all white guys voting. It felt like a really corrupt system. The I, boys club. So you had felt to like fit this, there. And I knew I didn't. And I remember like company members writing to me and being like, this is insane. We wish we could do something. And I'm like, but you can't. And I'm lucky that I had built enough outside of that for that not to be. But there was a whole year where I thought like I shouldn't do this anymore, which is crazy for a 25 and 26 year old to be asking themselves that, you know? And so that literally, that's why I was like, I'm not going to teach character stuff forever. I was like, I just want, (laughs) I want anyone to take a class and realize like they don't have to maybe feel like one school is their identity. Cause I, I, I think it was a real mind fuck. And I think it, you know, it was also like, you guys got to update your system to be. And also it's like, I still am a white woman. And it, like, there were so many other people that had different POVs that weren't represented within that. And I think, I think this year really opened up a lot of schools eyes to that. And they're really trying to like change the infrastructure of it. But I hope that isn't just like a blanket statement to get press off their case and that they really follow through with that because otherwise it just isn't indicative of comedy right now. And I felt like I would write things and, it, and just in general, it's like, you just want to make sure it matches the zeitgeist of what, what's happening, you know? Mm-hmm. Otherwise it feels kind of antiquated, you know? But yeah, I mean, I think there's so many great elements of each school. I just think mm-hmm. there's no one school is the right school. Like yeah. if it fits for you, go yeah. for it, but it doesn't have to, and it's not going to, it's not going to be one size fits all. Is there a place that you can recommend? Like, let's say you don't want to go that path. Yeah. Are, are there like, so like for me, when I was learning filmmaking, a lot of what I learned, I learned on set working on, you know, big productions, but YouTube helped a tremendous yeah. amount. Is there something like that for comedy where it's I mean, kind of grassroots? The Lyric Hyperion was a theater I really liked and started to host a character mic there after having done Characters Welcome at UCB with a friend of mine, Jensen, who's part of Very Gay Paint, because we felt like there wasn't a place for character performers to play without judgment or to give themselves permission without the competition, kind of inherently. Because that's the problem with the schools, right? Is it's like, whether you support people or not, there is still inherent competition. (laughs) It's like, you're still trying to compete to get to a Yeah, there's only so many spots. I think like some of these more independent theaters, and I also just think like, feeling free to sort of treat it like a buffet where you just survey each thing and then you kind of can take from it what you want. And I'm loving seeing people just launching their own shows and backyard shows and variety shows. And 
that's like a little something for everyone. That I think helped me the most was starting to put up my own things that I feel like had a little bit of stand up and a little bit of storytelling and a little character because I was like, that's how I feel as a comic. And I want to see that represented a little bit more. So I think encouraging people to go to those shows and then reaching out to peers that are there. I wish I would have done more of that when I was younger. Mm -hmm. But I also think it takes a level of, it's like hard to approach people you don't know. And yeah. anyone that does approach me now, I'm like, more power to you. Like there's this girl that runs a show called The Unbirthday Show. And it's in a really, really, really cool backyard in Silver Lake that someone just was like, sure. And she's like 23 or something and she's crushing it. And she just like has this incredible confidence and zest for life. And I'm like, good on you. And brings on amazing comedians because she offers a beautiful space and a photographer. and. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just kind of like be your own pioneer sort of thing, you know? Don't wait for somebody else to let you do it. Like you can fucking do it now. Was the onset of the pandemic sort of a jumping off point for you for a lot of things that you've been working on lately? Yeah, I think it was a really good, like, <laughs> it was a terrible year in a lot of ways, but it was also like a respite from everything. And I weirdly had a lot more career traction that year because I think I got to like pause and be like, what do I want to do? and got to test for a lot of cool projects and start developing my own thing. And so, yeah, I feel like it actually is sometimes a good thing to take a break and get quiet with yourself and go. I mean, ideally it wasn't that sort of break, yeah, but right. it, was a, it was a good, I think it was a good time. Cause I think sometimes you're moving so fast and you're like, what am I even working towards? Mm -hmm. So I think it was a good time to pause and be like, oh, I know exactly what I'm working That's about. what everything felt like during, like just before, like the world just kept moving in this direction and then kind of everyone, I think it benefited in some way or another, whether it was, you know, silver lining or like truly yeah. actually benefited, but it, from some way to like everything, getting a second look and just being able to stop and be like, okay, wait, is this working the way we've been doing things you yeah. know, for so long? And I also just think like perspective, like there were months, I started a group called Lend a Day where we yeah. work with the houseless community in downtown. And I got to meet Theo Henderson, who's like this incredible activist and like is working leaps and bounds, like to, to propel advocacy in a way that people haven't before. And it's like, oh, I feel much more connected to the city I live in because I like what I see and I don't like what I see and I'm like trying to work against what I don't like. So what are you I guys doing? What are you doing for them? Uh, we're going to host a series of power ups, which will offer like charging stations for not even our houseless neighbors, really anyone that comes by. Uh, it doesn't have to be houseless neighbor specific. I just mean, I want to have a community building place. That's like a hub in South LA for people to charge up tech, to be able to access Wi-Fi, to be able to you know, a lot of people haven't even gotten their stimulus payments yet because they don't have a computer to do so or to get a hot meal and we want to set up clothing and have like a barbecue and make it feel like, I think a lot of community outreach work can feel like charity and rather than like community. And, you know, we like shopping. We like going out for lunch. We like fun kiosks. It's like, why does it have to be framed as sort of this like handout sort of thing elitist yeah and it shouldn't have to it, you know if i had it my way it'd be like everyone would ha was housed and they could go to shopping centers and but that unfortunately isn't the case so i think just like trying to add some humanity to a really deeply problematic situation um around la has anything and, surprised you in that like in your time working with yeah. this community i mean yeah I, I think like the massive police control and like <laughs> how uh, something that you're up against that can make you feel really powerless. But also I think what's surprised me is how incredibly involved so many people in the comedy community are and how compassionate they are. And that I've made all these a really wonderful new friends purely because we'll do meal outreach in the morning or we'll do distribution or we'll, you know, Jared Goldstein and I have been able to do fundraising shows to stop Asian hate the last few months and that people really want to do that. Like that makes me really excited. And, you know, to your point earlier about like, I had such a weird introduction to stand up. Well, it's really changing for me because I'm meeting all these wonderful, compassionate standups that are brilliant and care about the world and, you know, are like using their platforms for good. And so yeah, if anything, I feel like I've been like surprised in a good way by... Do you have any sense of how you might fix this issue? It really has to be piecemeal. Like, I would just urge everyone, like, collectively to at least know what's going on locally and, like, put, you know, frozen water... We have a heat wave, so everyone's going to suffer from heat exhaustion. Hand out water bottles in your community. Uh, go to city council meetings. Like, find out who's on your city council. Like, what are they voting against and for? Because I think right now... And I think we're experiencing it. It's like, yeah, Biden and Kamala are not Trump, but like 
it's like there's still issues, you know? So it's like, instead of just feeling really passive aggressive about that, it's like, how can we inform ourselves on a local level? And in Lenda Day's case, it's like, well, we're gonna attach ourselves to one initiative that we believe in at a time. And for now it's building these power-ups with Theo Henderson. And I think just like trying to increase some compassion around this, but I don't think solve the problem is, is realistic. I think it's like, what can we do individually? And like trying to just like, you know, heighten our consciousness around it and just not turn a blind eye. Like, I think my biggest pet peeve is just people that are complaining about things and aren't like, you know, we don't need to be like doing distribution every day, but it's then share infographics, then volunteer once a month about the thing that bothers you, you know? And I was just sick of being that person. <laughs> so, you know, there's definitely a long way to go and it's all, all about balance. We had a guy in here who was just grabbing a coffee and he came in and he was telling me about his, he has a nonprofit helping in a different way. But I was like, do you think we're gonna solve it? And he goes, yeah. And I was like, you do? And he, I was like, why do you think that? He's like, because it's our problem. He's like, and we solve problems as a community. And I was like, oh, that's some powerful shit. You know, wow. I wish I had such an optimistic <laughs> attitude right? about it. Cause I think the hardest thing with about. activism yeah. work is to not feel defeated all the time. Yeah. But I do think there is a collective consciousness. This sounds so like I'm in a Ted talk, but I think things are different now. Like I feel like people are waking up a bit more to the problems that are around them. And I feel like we all just inherently from the last 15 months feel more connected and therefore feel a little bit more responsible for what's happening. So that gives me hope is that, and you have these like Gen Z, you know, I saw that like at that Trump convention, they like signed up for all these tickets oh, yeah. and then like nobody was there. I'm like, yeah. okay, if there's some like 22 year old out there that's doing that, like, and you have like Greta Thunberg's like, okay, they're the future. We're in good shape. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that excites me, you know, I'm like, they're putting all their crazy manic teen energy into good shit. Yeah. You know, it's, it's helping yeah. a lot. I heard that was the BTS army. Honestly, would not surprise me. Yeah. They That's are an the army. thing. Like if they would just be like, here's the BTS happy meal, by the way, for everyone. I mean, they use that for like registering to vote and things. Yeah. Uh, but kind of, I think that that is the future is like more. And I think brands are feeling a lot of pressure to whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Some of them are making blanket statements, but if it means that some of them are like Victoria's Secret, it uh, sucks that it took long this long, but coming. I'm like, at least they're doing it. Yeah. Like, yeah. I think it's hollow and surface of shit and we can all see right through it, but at least they're fucking doing it. Right, you know? It's better than the alternative. It's better than the alternative, yeah. exactly. Hang on, hang on. If you're not subscribed, can you go ahead and do that right now before we get on with the video? Helps us out tremendously. That's all we ask, and we're back. We lived in San Francisco, and so the, the problem was, like, I mean, abundant. And there was, like, a black market where the EBT cards, so the homeless people would get them, and then they would go to a liquor store, and they would trade them in for cash. But they wouldn't, the liquor store would give them, like, $200 versus, like, the $400 that was on the card. And then they would use that money, and I would see this every day. And, and then they'd go use that money to, get buy, to buy drugs or alcohol. And I mean, people like our age shooting up on the street, it was like insane. And then I would chat with them. And the community is just not involved so, at all. It was like, there's all these different camps. There's like one camp of mental health for sure is a yeah. big issue. There's another camp of, we just want to be homeless, like, or like houseless. That, like that, it, and it was like shocking to you hear. Know, That's a San Francisco, it's gotta I be. I mean, and also like to your point about substance abuse is unfortunately like the stigma attached to that that's the collective and statistically it just isn't, but also the only thing that drives, I mean, I'm not saying the only thing, you know, you could argue that there's people using Coke on Wall Street and we don't For know sure. about it and it's fucking happening everywhere. They just have access to more expensive drugs. We, we, you have, know? Some. we have some, we have some. Not to mention like, you know, we have like street sweeping, but they will bypass encampments to make people look dirtier. So. And then the guy working at the at the liquor store that has to pay a ridiculous amount of rent. I mean, it's all coming up from the top and then everyone's just surviving how, however best they can. The problem is things they're trying to implement instead of mental health programs are like uh, essentially sober living boxes for people to live in, which is like give you an 11 o'clock curfew and doesn't work for anybody. Doesn't That doesn't work for anybody, let alone someone that's already come from a really broken situation and wants compassion and wants to be treated like a human, not like a scolded toddler. So, and it's so hard because I'm also like, if I had nothing fucking going for me and no government looking out for me and people like handing me charity, 
I might, I'd be like, well, I want to be fucked up all the time. Do you know what I mean? Right. <laughs> like, what else right. do I, you know? Yeah. But also I think it's like important to say that that's so not the collective, that, that doesn't speak for everyone. It's just, you know, I just watched this doc about like the Cecil Hotel in downtown and I was so mad because half of the emphasis was like, and it was on Fifth and Main Street, the most dangerous block in Los Angeles. And I'm like, I'm down there every weekend like I'm more threatened by like the creepy drunk Laxboro guy who's like driving and cat calling me in West Hollywood than I, it just, it's just like, we all make these blanket statements and judgments. And unfortunately like news media outlets aren't making it better. They're just catastrophizing any situation for, for the news. And then that's what people effect. are learning. And then they think all houseless communities are drug addicts and freeloaders. And, and it's just not, you know, we don't know the intricacies of it. So so yeah, I know, and it's a longer conversation, but yeah, it's just hard. It's no, hard. It's, it's a good one. I think uh, there's this lady that my hairdresser, oddly, or my whatever barber. This woman like died apparently, like in her sleep, like for was out and then came back to life. And, what? And when she was dead, yeah. like statistic, like dead, like she had this moment where she basically like so she was raised Jewish, oddly enough, and okay. so she knew she knew Hebrew. And cool, I'm a new in, Jew, so I get it. <laughs> <laughs> new Jew. In this like dimension, she entered. Jesus was there. Which, but as like a godly figure. And so it threw, it was she, would, she, she was like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, this is crazy. I don't believe in this. Why is this here? And like Gosh. Buddha and like all of the symbols of religion were like in this dimension that she entered. And so what she realized was she's like, oh, they're actually all the same thing. They're just like different ways of interpreting, but they're all totally. the same. They're totally connected. Yeah. And then she had this other thing where it's like on earth, everyone's very emotional and that clouds people's judgment. And she's like, we're in the dimension she entered. There's no wrong or right. And so if someone's stealing, it's not because they want to be stealing. It's because they literally need right. that thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so they're just trying to solve the problem that they have. And with the, with the abilities or the means or the skills they have. Totally. That's all it is. And so she came back and maybe two months later, her house in Malibu was like, got, got broken into. And she's just like five foot one, very small woman. Yeah. And, and she was like, don't take my art, but I'll give you whatever you want. So let me help you because you're caught. And she, and she said, like, I can call the police right now, but that's not going to help you at all. No. And then you're no. not going to be a good parent. Mm -hmm. They were men. So she's like, you're not going to be a good dad. Yeah. And this problem gets worse. Yeah. So let's figure out a way to make you guys whole. Wow. In that moment. And it was like this. That's amazing. Super beautiful. So you, you were alluding to that in some way when we're talking yeah. about like this, this judgment that exists. Well, and also like. I had my phone stolen the other day and the only way you can get an insurance claim is to call the police. And that's the last thing I wanted to do. Yeah. And I hate that that's, that's the option. That's the go-to. It doesn't, that just does, doesn't make any sense and doesn't make, doesn't feel like the right program for something like that. Especially when, and I ended up texting the person who was like probably a 19 year old kid. And I was like, the last thing I want to do is add something to your goddamn record. Just turn it in anonymously at night, which they did. And then had left all these selfies and whatever on my phone. And I was like, you know, you're lucky that I don't give a shit. Yeah. But like, it just, w what drives people to act the way they do is this sense of scarcity that we have. Is this insanely capitalistic, you know? It's like, why do other countries have completely different crime rates, you know? It's like, we're living off scarcity, so we're like, why does that person rob? Maybe they had a kid too young and they have to support the kid and the kid has a pre-existing condition like asthma. And the only way that they can pay for a $200 inhaler out of pocket without insurance is, so it's just like, and again, I know it's really hard to have compassion for everybody all the time. I just think it's important to be like, what is the why to why people act the way they do? Because yeah, there are the crime podcasts where there's the serial killer who just like likes blood yeah right you know and just like wants to murder yeah but i think that's like the like the really rare 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 case yeah. you know and it's just so easy to to create these labels and it's like if we don't want that projected upon us then i feel like we have to do better to not make assumptions about other people and their situation you in, know in uh, mosquito coast which is a show on apple tv right now so justin, Ju Theroux. justin Theroux, who actually mm. runs by here like every oh, wow. day oh, with the backpack full. Yeah, does he look that Bro good? Bro is person? ripped. Wow. Ripped. What he has like a backpack of weights. <laughs> yeah, like so you're saying you said yeah. three o'clock yeah. Pacific yeah, yeah, yeah. time? Between three and three ten, you think? Okay. It's Sounds around good. Two. I have a meeting yeah. here and it's outside. Right. Yes. So it's See you tomorrow. <laughs> There's a scene in there where he's like taking his daughter or his kids are like fleeing mm -hmm. and they end up in an encampment and he says to them, He's like, don't be afraid. These, these, they are unfortunately what the non-consumers look like. He's like, they actually know much more than we do. 
Uh huh. And oh I was, my God. and it wow. was like this powerful yeah. scene. Yep. It's it's a quick thing though, so if you don't pick it up, you're, you're not going to miss not it. Consuming. And he's like, and this is their for punishment consuming. for not consuming. Yeah. And I was like, that's so good. Yeah. You know, and, and it was good to see it because it was like, hopefully, this you know opens up some level of consciousness with a lot of people. Totally. I mean, again, like I I don't think that I can be the person that's like the solution. I just there's too much we're there's up against. I mean, yeah. I think that about everything. I think that about politics as a whole. I think there's just too much control for us to, but it is really, really, really rewarding to see something from idea to execution, like happen, you know, and like Theo's running power-ups in to little Tokyo and has for months and months with other groups. And it's like, great. That's one more thing that the community can benefit from. And it seems like a small thing, but it isn't to a community of people that need that, you know? So, and I think we're learning like, yeah, you can change the president and like, it's great and all. I don't, I certainly just, I didn't want Trump to have the freaking. Just, I didn't even want him to have the, the, the satisfaction of being in power, but politicians are still politicians. So, you know, it's like, I think we kind of have to learn how to infiltrate on a smaller scale. The world's a complex place with complex problems. So anyone who's still offering you a simple solution is lying because right. they're, they're going to require a complex solution. So yeah. like, you know, even, but that's not to say that you can't start with simple projects, like even just doing your power-ups in DTLA, yeah. it's not maybe going to solve the entire problem, but it's, it's a good start. Certainly. And, and I mean, just staying to. in your house, like, or starting in your house. That's what Jordan Peterson talks about it yeah. all the time. He's like, yeah, great. So you're virtue signaling, but like, what are you doing at your house? Right. And if you're not, and I know you're not well, doing yeah, that, like so stop talking Well, yeah, like great canvas or like, yeah. you know, or, you know, I just did the houseless census count, which is that, and it took an hour and we drove around little, we drove around Koreatown and we knew that way you can report a number, project how many houseless folks are living in that neighborhood. So they know how many resources and how much money to allocate to that place. And so it's just like you Google and you can look something up and it's like, it doesn't have to be an everyday. I've even like, it's, it's that balance where with Lend a Day stuff, I'm just really busy right now with other work projects, but I understand that that's always there and it's an ongoing thing. And it's, it's learning to make that a part of your life from now on, as opposed to check in, like find something you believe in and be like, once a month, I'm going to get to like hang out with my friends at like Watts Community Corps and like help hand out dinners and what have you. So agreed. It's like nothing is a a sentence fix. Yeah. It's not. It's simply not. It's There's too many channels to go through. Right. Lend you know? a day? You said lend a day? It's called lend a day. Lend yeah. a day. Yeah. And that's our Venmo. Uh, and we're always accepting donations. And I always like to say like $5 is a case of water and enough for a whole hygiene kit. So a little goes a long way. Little goes a very long way. To go back to your comedy career. Yeah. <laughs> do you, do you consider at all? Like what would happen if you got famous? I think about it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> In, in a good um, what way do you or, mean? Like, what would happen? Like, so some people, you know, I think a lot of people chase it, yeah. and then they see it, and it's almost like they misunderstood it. It's yeah. almost like they wish they didn't have it because, to some extent, I mean, it really depends what you get famous for. But let's pretend you get famous for being a comedian. Then now you're in this box, mm -hmm. to some extent. Right. Like the world has put you in this box, and they just want to hear this, and they're like, "Don't tell us about Linda Day. Just tell us about being funny and be funny." Right. And there's conflict in that sometimes, but at the same time you have a platform and so you can use that platform. Right. Uh, but how do you, you know, how do you view that? Well, I think I've kind of made that virtually impossible because from a really early on point, I've been like, here are my views and you can either stay or you can leave, which I, I think it's very much to each their own with that. Like nobody owes anybody that that's just helped me. I've also like talking candidly about like recovering from an eating disorder and like mental health. And I mean, I don't know what much would, change other than that like I feel like I've surrounded myself with people who I want to succeed with me and that like really want things for genuinely great reasons and I think at their core are good I would just like to have more of a voice to reach more people for that and not just I mean yeah obviously like for outreach and advocacy work but also like to make people laugh and like make people laugh at how funny humans are. Like, I really feel like a big cornerstone of my comedy is being able to like laugh at yourself, being able to laugh at other people, not from a mean-spirited place, but purely from an observational place. You like know? if they got a little chubby, you're saying. <laughs> well, <laughs> no. it's, not, it's not about your family. No. No. <laughs> no, but like the whole, you know, the <laughs> whole reason- Greta Thunberg on summer break. <laughs> yeah, like I met, you know, the whole reason that I did like 
a brewery chick characters because I like went to a brewery and I couldn't believe how informed someone was on. Is this the one that makes you cackle? Yeah. On beers. <laughs> uh-huh. And like, it felt like half it? the beers were made up. Let's do this. Do this. <laughs> oh no, <laughs> no it's too hard. They're just like, for sure, for sure. Like I got like a, it's like a, like notes of like, like lake water. And like, wow. <laughs> you know, it doesn't, you know, it all is like, is that a real, uh, but again, it's, it's That's like hilarious. satirizing people. Yeah. And, and I think if I, you know, it could be a good a good voice for that, uh, and that you and that you don't have to be like cool girl of comedy to be funny and to like be successful. I would yeah. argue the opposite is even funnier. <laughs> cool yeah, girl, whatever cool girl is. It's yeah, fun. whatever. Yeah. But also, I can play cool girl. Yeah. Like it's funny. I feel like I know how to be way cooler as like oh, like I'm a chain smoking character that's like <laughs> everything's like corrupt. You know, I know how to do that too. I just. I have more fun doing it with like a wig on, not yeah. as Hannah, you know? <laughs> At night before I go to bed, I always watch like comedy uh, on YouTube, yeah. but I'll watch like Don Rickles or I'll watch mm-hmm. like super old, Love that. some Jerry Seinfeld. And it's, yeah. it's just like, you get to recognize how in a box comedians were oh, back yeah. then compared to today. Totally. It's like, you have to be scripted, scripted, back super to like, what is your, what's your one sheet pitch? And people were very PC and I don't think people recognize that. Like people think there's this stigma of like, oh, we're so sensitive today. But if you watch Don Rickles do a bit back then, people boo him. Like they're like boo. And he's like, oh, shut up. Well, it sucks because it was like PC and then it was like fucking bad. Like a yeah. comedy does not age well. Like I'm like, yeah, man, I really laughed for at that sure. deeply problematic Mad TV sketch years ago. But I think the positive of that is that we can say that, you know, that I can say, oh, I see what's so the progress about. Yeah. But do you yeah. think that's a uh, symptom of what you were talking about earlier where you're up on stage and you're just divulging everything because it's getting a laugh. And so maybe you lose the filter in the moment. What I would argue that somebody that's filtered, like, I think that probably 80% of stand up in the Midwest should cease to exist. <laughs> like, that's, that's a big percentage, but there's just wow. so, there's well. <laughs> so much, like, st- like my fucking wife culture yeah. that I just, uh, like, I hate that. have no tolerance for. And again, I think if that's their inner monologue, like, I'm not interested. Sure. I just, again, though, one could argue that, great, there's, like, a platform for everybody. I just don't want that person to be saying offensive things. That's where I have the hard time. I don't care about your filter, but if you need therapy so that you aren't, like, woman-hating, then get therapy. And then I'm, I just think, like, what a cheap go-to, sure. you know? There can be a beauty to being unfiltered. I just, ideally, it's not promoting the wrong message. I was on stage the other night and was having so much fun and like ended up talking about a threesome, you know, but it didn't hurt anyone and it wasn't like at the expense of someone else. But I think that probably is how a lot of stuff, you know, is born in the wrong way. (laughs) Right, right. Yeah. And that people, it's the capitalism thing again. It's that there's a lot of comedians that said an offensive thing that made people laugh that like the bookers will still put them up and they get to live in that world. That feedback loop. Yeah. Keeps going. Uh, But I think that's not what I'm seeing publicized lately nearly as much. So that's what's exciting. Yeah. You know, right. Very Um, much so. Do you have any favorite comedians? Maria Bamford, Chloe Feynman, one of my best friends, Jensen and Nick, Nori. I'm trying to think of like Molly Shannon is all that I've ever wanted and all that I She's the SNL. She's towards. on towards. Yeah. Right. right? Like, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I feel very like kindred spirit to her whole incredible career and career path. I'm really big into Renee Ellsbury right now. Renee Elise, who's on Girls 5 Eva. She's a Hamilton star and is, and Busy, I love the show. Busy Phillips is amazing. These Broadway stars that are suddenly like getting into the comedy space, they're so technically proficient. So they're clowning. Like I love like Ty Burrell in Modern Family and like Ross and Friends. You know, like it's just like, I'm a big sucker for like expert physical comedy and clowning. Um, and I think like David Schwimmer did that expertly. Lisa Kudrow forever. Yes. Oh, um, favorite. Yeah, yeah. What's that show? The Wonderful so Mrs. Good. Maisel. Oh yeah, yes. that's one of that's been one of my favorite so shows. Good. Yeah, so Rachel Brosnahan. Well done. Unreal. Jeez. And it's so like so edgy. visually stunning too. Yes. It is. Yeah. Everything Alex from Borstein's from the writing yeah. to the directing to the acting, everything is just so in sync and so wonderfully done. Yeah, it pulls designers. you into that time period as well. And honestly, Gene Smart is like blowing my goddamn mind with Hack, and I'm like, you're at f- like the timing, iconic, funny, and also just like funny with depth. It's like it's the kind it's of like comedy a you have to re- like you have to like go back 30 seconds yeah or rewind yeah. if you're a 90s kid like you got to go back and go that was really good totally like their their dialogue yeah it's and a it's so amazing 
And it's the like, writing. There's so, so many great. good jokes layered, 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 layered. Yeah. Where can people find you? Tell everyone where they can find, find me all on, your I'm comedy. I'm never on TikTok. You're on Vine? You can find me on Instagram. <laughs> you can find me on Instagram. She's the and, only uh, account left. I have a lot of dates that I'll be putting up for the summer, and then I'm going to start doing a monthly show in New York, so I will release be releasing more dates soon for shows. At Hannah Pilks? Hannah Pilkis on Instagram. Oh, yeah. sorry. It's fine. It happened. looks like yeah. it should be Pilks, but it's Pilkis. I'm so bad with names. Tara, Tara. But it's the way it's spelled like, in English, like it should, it should be when do you get married? We are hoping for. I'm like, I'm like maybe. Um, <laughs> we're thinking next August, like a redwoods, oh yeah, fairy tale forest, Very cool. gnome wedding. Yeah, <laughs> yes. I want to nice. feel like I, you know. I have a yeah. lot of Dutch background. My dad's from Holland, so I want it to feel very like whimsical and yeah. Dutch fairy tale. Find a kind of. windmill. Find a windmill. Well, you know, I like my. This woman did my hair and makeup at a shoot the other day, and she was like. I asked her to do my hair and makeup at my wedding, and I was like, oh, are you married? She's like, yeah, I got married in Holland. I was like, huh? I said, Mid-summer. are you Dutch? She said, I just like Holland, which is like, stop the record. Right. I don't hear that a lot. I mean, not that you don't like Holland. It was just a random. Yeah, it's very. She got married by a windmill, and yeah. Off I don't right. want to. I feel like I. Golf center? I don't want to yeah. make people spend that much money to go watch me get married in Holland, but maybe the honeymoon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. There's mm-hmm. got to be a windmill somewhere. Right. There's got to be yeah. a windmill and like little wooden shoes and yes. like mushrooms that everyone can sit on. Yeah. And maybe ingest and like on day yeah. three. We can all I think midsummer ruined right. the Truth Dutch. waffles <laughs> as appetizers. Midsummer. Midsummer. Yeah. yeah. Midsummer. Yeah. 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 I don't want it to take that dark turn. That's Swedish. Yeah. yeah. Swedish. Yeah. But everyone will eat like those cookies that like throw waffles. waffles. Yeah. Yes. Are you Dutch? No, but I enjoyed my time there. It's It's a great place. I thought you seem tall, blonde. Yeah. Yeah. I fit in well with the population. Yeah. Totally. Conversely, my partner's five, six and like could not fit on any of the bikes because oh. <laughs> we, my family are all like six foot and over and he was like well i can't bike this so i guess we're walking um love my short king i will take a taxi <laughs> short yeah, literally he's the best that's really funny in yeah. itself uh, that's, that that's a bit that's gotta be <laughs> i know i know i've definitely used it in stand up but he doesn't he likes doesn't mind being the butt of the joke the butt of the joke is not that he's short it's that he has like tall guy energy and that it took me finding the short king to fall in love Oh, um, I love yeah. that. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you guys for having yeah, me. Pleasure having you. So much fun. Great meeting you. Thank you. <laughs>